How are we doing this morning? Chilly enough for you out there? Was it good? But those blue skies are nice, aren't they? So delightful. Um, when, when we have that much blessing of water, uh, you're, you wonder when is it not a blessing? Do you wonder? <laughs> uh, it's interesting. In the, in the scriptures, there is a sense where uh, whenever a river is overflowing its banks, it's not a burden, it's a blessing because it means there's been a, um, a pouring out of good things. And so I think that we should just receive the rain as a blessing. Don't you think so? Yeah, I think we can deal with a little bit of road repair, right? We can deal with a little bit of that. God wants us to strengthen our life so much so that when a storm comes, we're not worried about it. Um, that's what a good foundation is supposed to give us. And so that's the title of our series, Foundations, uh, because sometimes we see even blessings come and they can overwhelm us. And we're not sure to ha how to handle those. I think in America, that's probably, we're probably guilty of that, right? There's a lot of blessings we have in our land. We're not even sure how to handle those blessings. And so that's because we've put our foundation on the wrong kinds of things. And so today we want to reinforce the right foundation. And as we do that, we're looking at a little book in the Bible called Colossians. It's named after a town called Colossae. Uh, the Apostle Paul was writing to that little town. And then the letter that they received, they would then send that to... Uh, Another, another town and then another town. So they would share this letter and now the letter comes to Merced and we share it with Mercedians. And uh, we ask that you would just kind of think about your own foundation in light of the scriptures. The foundation that we've kind of laid or that has been laid for us if we understand who Jesus is, is the gospel. And one author has said the gospel is the good news that God, who is more holy than we can imagine, looked upon with compassion people who are more sinful than we could possibly admit and sent his son into history to establish his kingdom and to redeem people and the world to himself. Jesus, whose love is more extravagant than we can measure, came to sacrificially die for us so that we, through his death and resurrection, might receive by his grace what the Bible describes as real and eternal life. That's the gospel. Have you received it? When you receive that gospel, it's woven in to the person of who Jesus is. We cannot separate Jesus from the gospel. They're one and the same. And so we're hoping that you know who he is, that you're building your life on that. When the Apostle Paul is moving through the little, little book of Colossians, he moves through some introductory comments, kind of establishes what the gospel is. Uh, he instructs the believers about what being sold out is through his own life as a model, an example of that. And then in chapter two, he starts getting to the heart of his message which is really a message that has to do with his, his concern that the believers in Colossae as well as Heropolis and the other areas around them are vulnerable, are vulnerable to something kind of arresting their forward movement. And so maybe you've had that happen with you before. You've been going along just fine and then all of a sudden you find yourself kind of side, side railed or, or distracted by something and you're, not, you're no longer moving forward. You're stuck or you're stalled or maybe even you're regressing, you're, you're sliding backwards. Has anybody ever had that happen in their journey? That's the real topic of today's message is how to make forward progress, how to do that. And so we're going to look at a little passage, a pretty short set of verses, verse uh, 4 through verse 7 of chapter 2. So let me go through that and then we'll come back and make some comments about each one of those verses. Uh, verse 4, he says, I tell you this, and I always love whenever he, he does that because it's kind of like, you who. <clears throat> I told you about Jesus being the foundation. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by what? By what? Fine-sounding arguments. For even though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith, and over, just as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. So that's it. Pretty short, huh? So we're going to talk about several things there. Uh, the first thing we want to talk about is the, is the need for progress. So you think about progress. Progress is one of those things that we all want to make in life. We want to make progress in our jobs. We want to make progress in our relationships. We want to make progress in our health. We want to make progress in so many areas. Progress is something we desire to do. And yet progress can be difficult to do because it calls us to do evaluation. It, it calls us to be willing to sometimes struggle or put extra energy in order to make progress. 
uh, Martin Luther King said it well. He said, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires suffering. What's the next one? Sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. I think that's really true. That's true. I think not only is that true for just human progress, I know that is also true for spiritual progress. In fact, I think we're very, very vulnerable in spiritual progress because we can kind of lose our way. Before I kind of tease out this idea of the need for progress, I want to just jump back up to the verse, the first verse in your notes, which is verse 6, right? It says, uh, now, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, do what? Continue to live in Him. So I want to talk about that a little bit because I always want to try to uh, help you see why I'm saying what I'm saying. See from the text why I make the point that I make. So literally, that verse is the title of your message, okay? How to make spiritual progress. Can you see progress in that verse? So then just as you receive Christ Jesus, Lord, do what? Continue. You see, some of us, we, we maybe have said a prayer somewhere along the journey of our life. Maybe as a, as a, as a teenager, as an adolescent, we said a prayer. We were in church one day. We were at a youth meeting one day, and we said a prayer. And then life just happened, and, and we, we did life, but we're not really making much progress because we don't have that sense of continuing in. And so literally he's saying that, that because you've got a relationship with Christ, don't let that fool you into thinking you're, you're safe, or you're secure, or you're going to be well, or you're going to do well. You've got to continue to pursue something. And he makes several points there that I think are worth kind of highlighting. So then just as you received Christ Jesus, how did you receive Christ Jesus? Do you know how? It's, the Bible says that you're saved by faith. Faith, yeah, it's your faith, your belief in and belief has to do with a, a deep sense of trusting in and relying on. And so faith is something we believe in, in something. It's not just faith. It's faith in the right object. I can have faith in something that has no truth at all, no validity at all. And so he's not saying just faith, but faith in Christ Jesus as as Lord. He's, so he's not just saying uh, that you believed in Jesus, that believed that he was a historical figure, that he existed, that he's a good teacher, uh, that he was a role model of some kind. It's not just those things. He said that you had faith, you had a willingness to trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. That means the one that's in charge, the one that has authority in your life. And so if you have a foundation on Jesus, it's because you've trusted him not as a savior, not as a teacher, not as a prophet, but as the one that you would allow to be in control of your life. That's understanding your foundation. And so if my very premise of what I believe is, is I don't believe he can be Lord, that he deserves to have control of my life, if I, if I fail that, then my foundation is already in jeopardy. It's already fragile. It's already compromised. And so he says, just as you exercise faith to believe Jesus is who he said he was and let him have the control in your life that you need to let him have, just as you've done that, if you've done that, if you've not done that, then you've got to go back and, and reestablish the foundation and say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord. I want you to be in control. I want to stop trying to control everything and I want to relinquish control over to you. And so as you receive him as Lord, continue to live in him. So this now this faith says, I'm now going to set out, I'm going to move forward in this relationship with Christ to develop what he has given me at the beginning. You see the progress that he's suggesting? So then just as you receive Christ Jesus, Lord, continue to live in him. Those were that little phrase, live in him. You might want to underline that. That little phrase, live in him, is interesting. It's the word peripateo in the Greek, and it's, it literally has movement the, that word is about movement and that, that we lose a little bit in a translation. Most translations um, bring that out as something that we, that we live. We're going we're gonna to live out. But the literal word means peri is to peri, is to turn. And then pateo is the word walk, peri pateo. I'm going to turn and walk. I'm going to turn. I'm going to peri and I'm going to turn. I'm going to walk in him. There's movement. Literally, the word conveys the idea of movement. Not standing still, not regressing, but moving forward. God wants you to move forward, but you've got to make a choice to parry, to turn. You've got to make a choice to walk in Him, to move forward in your relationship with Him. How do I do that? Well, the need for progress, the reason He says you've got to do that, the need is in verse 4. So we were in 7. Let's back up to verse 4. 
where he says, I tell you this so that no one may, circle the word deceive, so that no one may deceive you, and here it is, that's really good, by fine sounding arguments. I think it's interesting because I think sometimes we're, we're deceived by stupid arguments. I think sometimes we're just gullible, right? We just don't even, we don't even stop to think and, well, that's stupid, right? And we just kind of go along with it. I mean, every salesman, and this is nothing against salesmen. If you're a salesman, I, God loves you and I do too. Um, but, you know, salesmen, they, they're supposed to convince you, right, that whatever they have, you really need. And we would say, uh, the better the salesman, the more that, you know, they could, they could sell ice to an Eskimo, right? They could, they could let you need something that maybe you don't need at all. And we got a lot of salesmen in our world, don't we? We got a lot of good salesmen. They'll tell you, you need something and you didn't know you needed it. You went in, you got a washer and dryer, right? But this one has more cubic feet, right? And it's going to use less energy. And so you pay more money and buy something you already got, right? And so we're in that kind of a world where we're easily kind of moved and motivated, and those aren't major deceptions, but whenever we buy into something because the world's selling it that distracts us from forward progress, now that's a problem. It's not a big deal what kind of dryer you have. <laughs> your, your size of your cubic feet of your, your washing machine, it's not a big deal. But if you're giving away space in your heart, to something that's distracting you from forward movement, that's a problem. That's a problem. So you think about the fine-sounding arguments. I think a lot of times people will just say, you know what you ought to give your life to? You ought to work hard. You know, make a great living, make a name for yourself, rise up the corporate ladder. You know, that's your job to bring home the bacon, right? Okay, so you give your all to that. But have you ever seen somebody that gave their all to work, 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 and they neglected the things that mattered the most, like God and family? And so they might climb the corporate ladder only to find us leaning against the wrong wall, right? Not the wall that, that they should be climbing, not the thing they should be pursuing. And so fine-sounding argument sure sounds good, work ethic, right? And so it's a fine-sounding argument, but it can pull us and distract us totally away from what we should be doing, where we should be putting our energy and effort. What about the person that says, you know, you only go around once in life, so grab all the gusto you can. <laughs> what, what is that gusto? <laughs> I think it was a beer. I think it was a beer commercial. Wasn't that a beer commercial? <laughs> but the feel, what's the message in that little argument? The, the message there is experience pleasure anytime you get a chance to do it. Grab pleasure because you never can tell when that moment will pass you by, right? And so the idea is that experience as much pleasure as you can because, gosh, you sure don't want to miss a chance to, you know, feel good. <laughs> fine sounding argument or dumb sounding argument but we buy into it right so easily and readily and it distracts us from forward progress and we find ourselves arrested in our spiritual journey because something has pulled us away from the mark of where we need to be setting our eyes paul was concerned about almost every every church he wrote to because every church is vulnerable the church that was in the the town of Co of corinth this is Colossae in Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 said, But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived. Now look at this. Now if the first lady could be deceived, right, then, then, you, then who are you? Well, I mean, think about the first lady. I mean, she was married to a hunk, right? I mean, Adam was the perfect man, right? I mean, you're looking for the perfect man. She had him. She had the perfect man, and yet she was deceived. She had, she had the perfect environment. The Garden of Eden is like this magical environment. She had connection with God on a daily basis. Literally, it says God would walk with them in the cool of the garden. Whoa, whoa. I mean, that, just that whole experience as it's described in Genesis was absolutely magical. Eve had everything she could possibly want. And yet, just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, the best salesman of all. So I'm concerned that your sincere hearts may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. What, what, what is he saying? Over and over again, almost every church he wrote to, the apostle was concerned. He was concerned because he understood that deception runs in our culture. It flows through everything the media would communicate and every device Satan can and will use to pull you off track. And the best way to not get off track is to stay on track. It's to continue to make progress in your life. The great playwright, George Bernard Shaw said, progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. 
Are you stuck in a way of thinking? Or can you change your mind? I would propose that, that we need to change kind of the way we look at Jesus on a daily basis. The way we encounter God every day determines on whether or not we make steady, clear, definitive progress or we're arrested and may actually be pulled in the opposite direction. That we want to change our mind the way we think about that. We want to think that, that we are all vulnerable. There's a word, there's a term the Bible often uses to describe people that, that come to that relationship with Christ. Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord. There's a, there's a way the Bible describes that person. When they come into that relationship, the Bible calls them a big baby. A big baby. Well, not exactly that, but look what it says in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, um, then we will no longer be infants. A big baby, right? Tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the craftiness and cunningness of men in their deceitful scheming. He said, we're vulnerable. Why are we vulnerable? Because just as a child would be vulnerable, right? Just as you as a parent want to look after a child to say, I hope my child's not going to give in to that or give in to that. Why? Because they're vulnerable. But wait a second, they're six years old. I know they're so vulnerable. But wait a second, they're 16. I know they're so vulnerable. But wait a second, they're 26. I know, but they're so vulnerable. <laughs> it's like we have a hard time growing up, don't we? We have a hard time growing up because we have somewhere gotten the idea that we could just accept something and then we're done. I've accepted him as Lord. I'm done. You're not done. You've just begun. I mean, that is great that you said a prayer. That's great that you've acknowledged who he is. That's wonderful that you recognize that God sent his son. Beautiful. Fantastic. What are you going to do about that? You got to change your mind about what you're going to do with what you've been given. And so first of all, in verse four, he says, there is a huge need for progress. Unless you're making progress, you are probably being deceived. Unless you can tell me how you are making progress, you are probably not. Unless you can tell me how you're making progress, you are probably not. At the beginning of the year, we, we gave these little things called spiritual growth plans. Anybody remember those? Excellent. There's about eight of you that remember that. It's good. Um, if you, if you didn't get a chance to see that, we have an app called YC App. It's, you can just download it. It's cool. Technology does have some good things. And, uh, and you can bring up our spiritual growth plan. You can go to our website, bring up that plan. Uh, you can print out a copy. You can get copies for us. They're nice, really pretty copies, multicolored. Um, and you can actually kind of think about, you can deliberate about where am I going, right? So you can have a plan to move forward. And we give you some great ideas about how to move forward strategically and, and intentionally. Because if you're not intentional, then unintentionally you're going to find yourself somewhere you don't want to be. If you're not intentional about your progress, then unintentionally you'll find yourself somewhere you don't want to be. You're going to wake up someday and go, how did I get here? Because you didn't know where you were going. Because you didn't know the direction you really wanted to invest in. And so you ended up being distracted by something completely different. And so progress is so needed because we're all susceptible for deception the second thing, number two, is you're the nature of progress, the nature of progress. Then he kind of gets into this when he says, so then, um, just receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. And he gives us four participles, four participles. And these are verbs that, that, that describe how we do this progress. How are we to, to do this peripateo thing, to walk in, in a greater relationship with him? How does that flesh out? And he gives us four things. He says, being rooted um, and built up, strengthen the faith as you're taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. These four things, rooted, built up, strengthened, and overflowing with thankfulness. These four things are going to be things that, that we can say, okay, am I doing those things? And it's interesting, he, he, he takes from different um, metaphors. He first pulls from an agricultural uh, word, an agricultural word. Then he pulls from a, a word that kind of had to do with construction. Then he does one that's kind of a biological term. And then there's a, this natural overflowing of that. It comes back to kind of a natural thing about overflowing rivers and, and the earthly system. And so then, so all these things, he said, should be things you can do strategically with decision to move forward. So let's look at each one. The first one is to reinforce your foundation, your root system, right? Isn't that what that kind of conjures up in your mind? He says, just as you receive Christ Jesus, Lord, continue to live in him, rooted. Now, it's interesting, though, that this participle versus the next three is a little different. Uh, this is a past perfect participle. 
And so I know that some of you hated English, so I, please, we'll get past this quickly. It's okay, just bear with me just for a little bit. Because there's a distinction when you're kind of looking at Scripture. You want to see what, what word did he use, what tense the word was used, what, what, does that conclu- what can we conclude because of that. So a, a past perfect participle is one that says it's already been done. It's already been done. So, right, the whole premise of what he's saying is the people that are listening have received Jesus as Lord. They've done that. And so they've got this root. Their root is in who? Their root's in Jesus. That's their root system. And so because you've got that. And so so reinforce that. Being rooted, being rooted, it's happened. But you've got to reinforce that root system. You've got to know, how do I continue to draw my energy from Him? How do I continue to draw what's there and available? Richard Rohr reminds us that we cannot attain the presence of God. We are already totally in the presence of God. What's absent is awareness. Oh, my roots are there. I got to go back to my roots. I got to I got to draw from Him and say, Lord, give me that nourishment. Give me that life. And I love to kind of see how Scripture just reflects itself over and over. Uh, in um, Jeremiah seventeen seven and eight, it says, "Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord." whose confidence is in him, he will be like a what? Tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. Look at at this tree. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. That's a good tree. Isn't that a good tree? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about, look at your life, look at your spiritual life like a tree. Look at your spiritual life like a tree. And that tree, what does that tree do? Does that tree go, oh my gosh, I hope I bear some fruit. (laughs) Oh no, it's springtime. Oh no, I hope my leaves come green. The tree's not freaking out, right? the, The tree does not freak out. Are you a freaked out tree? Or are you a trusting tree? The tree just trusts. It just trusts. And so that's the, that's, the, that's the practical point for this first point. Rooted is you don't have to get new roots. you got roots. If you've accepted him as Lord, the root system's there. He's not, re-root, he's not replanting this tree. He's not uprooting and rerooting this tree. He's just saying the tree just trusts its roots. But this tree does so well because it's planted by the water. That's what you got to ask yourself. If I planted myself by the why, by the nourishment, am I cl- do I live close to Jesus? Because when I live close to Him, when I live in that awareness of His presence, my my just the way I am, I'm just going. Oh, I need oh, I need more of His assurance. I need more of that sense of His forgiveness. We talked about that with communion, right? All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. When I'm in that relationship with Him, when I'm planted. In a relationship with Jesus, my root system just draws upon the assurance of his love. But if you're not cultivating that assurance of his love, your roots are going to feel so distant. You're going to feel like a, in fact, the the context of Jeremiah, before he talks about the tree planted by the water, he talks about a bush in the desert that dries up and blows away. And some of you feel that way. You feel like you're about to dry up and blow away because you've never planted your roots. You've never really settled yourself in who Jesus is. You don't look to him daily to derive your strength and your energy and your nourishment. Trust. Are you trusting in him? Or do you trust in something else? Your 401k, maybe. (laughs) You you trust your Hoffman security system. Yeah, right. you, you, tr- you trust in other things, but how much do you really? I mean, honestly, we have so many things that we can trust in in America, right? We've got so much we can put our trust in. Do we trust in Jesus? What if your challenges, what if your problems, what if the things that are kind of nu- a nuisance to you, what if those things were God trying to refine your ability to say, Lord, I trust you. I want to nur- I I soak up more of who you are, Lord. I want to soak up more of who you are. John Kavanaugh, the famous ethicist. Now, bless you. Um, I didn't say atheist. Ethicist. You know what an ethicist is? An ethicist is someone who helps uh, organizations, countries, people 
develop their ethics, what they believe are true. And so he had an opportunity to uh, visit Calcutta. You just got a little tickle there, don't you? Um, so he wanted to help, he wanted to, had a chance to kind of go visit Mother Teresa in Calcutta and serve with her for three months in the house of the dying. How would you like that? What was that house? It was a house that people went to to die. We, we have those, don't we? <laughs> Convalescent homes. Right, similar kind of deal. These people were, though, they were, they were uh, identified as having a, a terminal disease. Usually they were usually way premature. They weren't, they weren't dying because they were old. They were dying because they had contracted something that was taking their life. And so they would go to the house of the dying and she would bring them in, um, susceptible to everything they had she was vulnerable to. And those that served and worked there were vulnerable to those things. And so he thought, I'm a, I want to go and I want to minister. I want to be side by side by her. I want her to teach me. And so on one occasion, he had a chance to visit with her and he said, Mother Teresa, would you please pray for me? Would you, uh, would you pray that God would give me greater clarity about all the things I'm supposed to do and, and the ways I'm supposed to do it? I just need, I want, I want, would you pray for me for, for greater clarity, Mother Teresa? And she said, no. It's like, no. Well, why not? He goes, well, I've never had clarity. Why would I pray for you to have clarity? He goes, wait a second, you're Mother Teresa. <laughs> you got to have clarity. She goes, no, nah, not all the time. I got clarity about a few things. Um, one thing, which is Jesus, but, but not a lot of clarity about other things. But I will pray for trust because that's what I have. Every day I trust that God will give me another day to be his hands. Every day I trust. At the end of the month, I don't know what kind of resources are going to come in. At the end of the year, I don't know how many will have survived and lived and, and been revived. I don't know how many will pass away. I, I, but I do trust. I trust that God's going to work in me and God's going to work through me. So I'll pray for trust. He said, I'll take it. Amen. Pray for trust. How's your trust? How's your trust in your roots? Are you confident those roots are by the stream that are, that are pulling in the resources God has for you? Are you willing to change your mind about that? I mean, Will Rogers said that you may be on the right road, but you're going to get run over if you just stand there. <laughs> I mean, I might be on the right road, but <laughs> that's no guarantee, right? You want to you move forward and say, God, I, I want to keep moving on the right road. And keep moving on the right road means, Lord, I want to continue to draw up trust, but not just being rooted, but being the next thing. Number two in your notes is I want to also build this relationship, my relationship with Christ. Not just reinforce my root, my foundation on Christ, but also build my relationship with Christ. Built up, rooted and built up in Him. This idea of building up really is good. So it goes from an agricultural term to a construction term. And have you ever built anything? Have you ever built anything? Have you ever, yeah, I don't know about you, but it's been interesting. Uh, it's a seamer said, and in a lot of cultures, a lot of towns, right, there'll be a boom that comes, right? A boom. Oh, there's, a, there's a resource boom, an economic boom. And when that happens, when the UC was coming to town, right, it was like, oh my gosh, the university is coming to town. We're going to be this amazing, you know, growing town. And so investors came and they bought places, right? You know this? And then it was like everything fell flat, right? There was this overinflated bubble and, and optimism, and we bought all this stuff. And you'd literally go into communities. And there would be entire, you know, sub-developments that had all the infrastructure, but they didn't have a foundation. Or there's some of them that had the foundations, but they had no, no, no sticks, no, no walls, no structure. Some had foundation and sticks, but it stopped there. Did you see those anywhere? You seen that happen before? Uh, kind of sad, isn't it? I mean, you drive and there's like a little ghost town, you know, it's like, you, you know somebody that lives somewhere in here. <laughs> In a real house, <laughs> but so many never turned into real houses and a long ways from real homes, and yet they had a foundation. They had a foundation, but they didn't build. You see, for, for some of us, we, at somewhere along the journey, we said yes to God, and we got a foundation, but you feel like you're exposed. You feel like you're not thriving because you've never taken the responsibility to build on that foundation. And he's saying that you've been given this amazing past tent, past perfect tense, this amazing root system that's there. Now, every, every other participle here is 
Perfect present tense. That means there's a continuous action. There's a continuous movement. There's a continuous building. There's a continuous strengthening. There's a continuous overflowing. Those are things you've got to continue to do to make progress. And so how's building? So think of yourself as a house. Look at your own spiritual life like a house and you are building. You're the builder. How is building? I want you to look at a, another passage of Scripture where he also uses this metaphor back to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians this time, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, you happen to be um, the God's field in which we are working. So he, he moves, literally in this text, he literally does also the agricultural metaphor, and then he moves. Look at this. Or to put it another way, right? So the biblical authors use different metaphors to kind of help us grasp what God wants to do and accomplish in our lives. Or another way, you are God's house. So I'm asking you just to consider yourself just like the scriptures would say to. Using the gifts God gave me as a good architect, I designed the blueprints. Apollos is putting up the walls. Let each carpenter, now he's talking about with their context, they would hear from multiple teachers. And then you do too. I mean, I, I mean I, there's no way in the world that I think that you only listen to Pastor Jeff. <laughs> you got multiple teachers, you got podcasts, you, some of you listen, watch the TV, you've got multiple teachers. But he's, kinda, he's making, a, a, uh, again, a challenge to these people he's concerned about that to be careful who they listen to and make sure that they don't tamper with the foundation. Make sure that whatever they're building is built well on the foundation. So he says, uh, let each carpenter who comes on the job take care to build on the on the foundation. Remember, there's only one foundation, the one already laid. Who is he? Jesus Christ. So, so isn't it interesting that every cult, uh, almost every cult will attack the nature of who Christ is. That's where they will they'll try to distort who Jesus is. And so make sure that no one messes with that foundation. But he's saying, think of yourself as a house. Now you got to build up from that. So build on that foundation. And so I'd say, hey, you know, how's your trusting and how's your building? Are you building anything? Are you, are you expanding? Have you ever, have you ever added on a, a, an aspect of who, your faith because you say, I need to expand my life? You're not like the Winchester Mystery House, I hope. Anybody ever visited the Winchester Mystery House? Yes. It's a crazy house. Literally, it's a crazy house. Right? I think it had a crazy lady that lived in that house. Right? She, was, she was obsessed with building more and more rooms, and she would, she would build and build and build, and, and she had the continuous thing going down. Right? She did that her entire life. She would build, 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 never stop building. Sometimes there are doors that lead nowhere. And some of you have done that. You've got a door that leads nowhere. Oh, it led somewhere, but the somewhere was really nowhere. Because once you got there, you said, where am I? How did I get here? This is nowhere that I wanted to be. And so some of you need to close some doors on some things you've allowed to be constructed that had no sense, no strategy, no effort, no intentionality, no continuity. And you need to think about how to have continuity. Isn't it? It's amazing when you think about architecture and, and people that build and design homes well right? And because it's like every space has meaning and purpose. No wasted space. No wasted space. Here's an interesting thing. If your building's going to go well, you got to recognize you don't, you don't master every part of the building process. There's, there's none of us that can do every part well. We really need one another. Back to that Ephesians passage in chapter 4, he says, from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and does what? Builds itself up in love as, say it with me, ready to go, as each part does its work. You see, he's saying that, that in, in building, if you're, if you're good at building and doing this part, rooted and built up, if you're good at the second part of this, you're not trying to do it all alone. You're not trying to be an independent contractor that does everything. But every good contractor loves his subs, right? They love the subcontractors because they're not good at plumbing. But they know Bob. Bob's great at plumbing. 
right? They're not good at electrical, but they, they've, got, they've got Rob, and Rob's a great electrician. They, they know someone that can contribute to the overall process, and so there's this interdependence that's necessary in building physical structures, and there's also an interdependence that's necessary to build a spiritual structure as well. And so are you trying to do it all alone? then you're never going to have the house God wants you to have spiritually. You're never going to have all the, 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 the rooms and the purpose and the utility that God wants you to have until you recognize you need others. So who are your others? Who are your subs? Your subcontractors in life. I mean, who empowers you to understand some part of Scripture a little bit better? Who kind of empowers you to understand the relational dynamics a little better than you kind of do by yourself? Because relationally, you kind of trip over yourself sometimes. Anybody ever do that? You, you, you tried, but you offended. Oh, how did I do that again? I offended again. And that's just kind of a, a record. You have all these offenses, and you just kind of keep going, I hope someone forgets my offenses, right? God has, but they didn't. <laughs> But why not get better at your relational part? Well, maybe you need someone who's good at that to be a voice into your world. That's the beauty of our small groups. That's the beauty of community is recognize you don't have to build alone. How's your trusting doing? How's your building doing? Notice he, he carries on from there. He goes on, you know, uh, rooted, built up in him. Strengthen in the faith as you were taught strengthen the faith. Now he goes to a biological metaphor. So this idea of being strengthened uh, really is the idea I want you to think of yourself, look at yourself like a, like a human body, like your, your faith, like a body that's, that need, needs some, some work and some energy to be well, well trained and developed. And so one of the verses there, I think, is, is it 1 Timothy 4, 7? Is that in your notes? Yeah. It's one of our key verses for being disciples. It says, um, have nothing to do with godless myths. I got to go back a little ways. An old wives' tales. Rather, circle the word. Train yourself for what? Rather, train yourself for godliness. For physical training is of some value, but spiritual, what? Is value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So the idea, he says, you, if you really want to be developed as a committed believer, if you want to make progress, you got to be involved in some training. Anybody go to the Go to the gym, right? Have you ever done that? I mean, I mean, if you're serious about going to the gym, I mean, some of us, we just want to go and just see people that are fit. We don't want to be fit. We just want to see people that are fit. Oh, that's what it looks like to be fit. <laughs> yeah, I wish I was that. <laughs> but some of us, we're really, we're really serious about it. We really go. And, and if you're really serious about getting fit, right, concerned about your physical fitness, and it says right there, it has some value, right? And it's just amazing that our culture puts it up as premium value, some people do, and put spiritual fitness somewhere really low on the priority. And so, right, that's his main point here, is what do you give more priority to, right? So that could be the deception of culture as well, right? That says, are you deceived by culture, by a fine-sounding argument, like you've got to have this great, great body? Because you go and you ask, if you're serious about it, you do more than visit it once a week, right? That's not a very good way to get fit. So if you're serious about it, you not only go regularly, but you get a trainer, right? You get someone that says, hey, I'll train you. I'll, I'll help work. What are your, and they'll say, so what are your goals? Come to the gym. And you go, well, I want to look great. <laughs> oh, okay. You don't look so great now. So good thing you're here, right? Uh, so there's some things we can do. So, so tell me, what, what do you think you need to do to look great? You know, they might say, you might give you a little, little tips, little hints. You go, okay, I can lose a few pounds. Okay, well, how many pounds do you want to lose? Oh, I don't know. 10, is that 20? 20 now, 30 now, 30 now, 40 now. They're trying to raise it up a little bit here to get you to be a little more motivated to say, I'll lose, you know, let's, is this an auction? Okay, is this a bid? This is a process, right? Okay, so what are they trying to do? They're trying to give you a picture of what would it look like, and that's part of what Paul's doing. He said, I want to give you a picture of what it looks like, but are you serious about strengthening, or are you the kind of person that takes your big gulp to the gym? Right? Sipping on your big gulp, watching everybody. Man, it's make, make me tired just to stand here. I think I'll sit down. So now you're watching everybody and someone comes by that's not doing anything. Hey, you want to go get some ice cream? I mean, you're just, how serious are you really about getting fit? Are you, you like just hanging out with fit people. That's what I like. It'll rub off, won't it? It won't rub off. Fitness doesn't rub off. You've got to make a choice. Say, I want to get fit. How's your training? 
How's your training? And then one of the things that kind of community is so woven into all this, I found that physical training for me is so much like spiritual training. The more I have someone to do it with, the better I am at it. I don't know, have you found that to be true? I mean, some people are so, so independent. They can, they can lose weight on their own. They can get fit on their own. But, but the Bible makes it pretty clear. You can't be everything God wants you to be all on your own. It requires the vulnerability of someone knowing your, your needed goals. It requires someone that you've disclosed how often you have fallen short and that you need to get back up and they encourage you and, and they go along with you and their confession reinforces your confession and their resolve reinforces your resolve. How's your training? How's your roots? How's your building going? Are you expanding at all? Are you adding on to your faith at all? God wants you to have a vision to add on. So, you know, I mean, if you're not involved in a, in a ministry, that's a whole new building project to say, I need to, be, I need to be investing my life in things that matter and serving. Annette gave us a great opportunity with, with Love, Inc. to do that. Right? If there's no vision of, of not adding on, well, maybe you're saying, well, I, I really got the small group thing down or, or I'm getting the daily thing down pretty well, but what about, what do you want to add on? Can I add on some service to that that says, I'll go and be selfless in this place? I can't. I struggle to be selfless all the time. That's the goal. But if you're not selfless somewhere, how will you ever be selfless everywhere? And so are you building on? Are you, are you training? Because if you can't, you can't try to be selfless, you've got to train to be selfless. We gotta, you, can't, you can't try. Wake up one day, I'm going to try to be selfless. That'll last for about 15 minutes. You're great until you saw the other people in your house. And it screwed it all up. Right, because you run into these other selfish people and just blows, you know, just takes you out of the equation. God wants you to, to find this rhythm of learning that when you train every day, when you train, I die to flesh every single day. Why? Because just like you, I don't always want to say no to my first nature. Just like you, every day, I don't always want to say no to the part of me that wants to be selfish and preoccupied and self consumed. I don't always want to say no to that, but I say no to that every single day, and I'm discovering it's easier to say no to me. How easy, how easy do you find it to say no to you? Because if you cannot conquer yourself, you will not do well living for him. Because Jesus said, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. How's your roots? How's your building? How's your training? Uh, the, the fourth one, I, I kind of wrestle with. I'm not, I'm not completely sure if it's, if it's just a, a cause and effect, if it just kind of happens. I think in some ways it does, but I think it also has to be cultivated because there's no, there's no difference. It's the same tense, the same stacking of these participles, overflowing with thankfulness, overflowing with thankfulness. So there is, there is something about this. All that's been happening, there's been a strengthening, there's been a building. There's all this stuff that I'm pouring in to my spiritual journey. And so, of course, there is that sense that there's going to be an overflow of stuff. And I think that's absolutely true. If I am building well and I am training well, I am much more likely to be grateful well. I am. I am. I just, so I, I want, to th want you to think about yourself, your, your faith as this, as this river, this river that is... That is you know, you can be parched and dry and dried up, or you can, be, you can be kind of brimming at the banks and about to overflow. And sometimes when people overflow, you know, it wipes out somebody's road. <laughs> and people get freaked out. Oh, no, it's a mudslide. <laughs> but I would rather us be overflowing than bone dry. Wouldn't you? God wants you to be brimming the banks. He wants all that to happen. But I think there's intentionality there. We've got to decide to cultivate a spirit of gratitude. And the Bible just flows. I mean, the first, first chapter, chapter uh, 1, verse 12, he says, um, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who is what? qualified you. I love that. I, he was so grateful in that first chapter because he was trying to remind us about the foundation that we don't qualify ourselves. Your good works doesn't qualify you. God doesn't go, oh my gosh, God let you in heaven. Woo, you're amazing. <laughs> That's, well, our good works don't qualify us. It was his good works that qualified us. And so I don't do any good work for redemption. 
I do every work because of redemption. And so I'm qualified, not because, you know, I've impressed God, but because I, imp I accepted the impressive work of Jesus on my behalf. That's a great reason to overflow, isn't it? Yeah, there it is. I'm joy. I'm so joyful. I'm so jo filled with joy because of why I'm qualified because of God. I never have to stand before the idea that the judge would see me and say, you're not qualified. I know it, but Jesus is, so come on in, right? Because he's given me your pay. He's given you a pass. That's a reason to be joyful every single day. And I would wager that most of you, when you're pretty down, you've been thinking you've got to qualify yourself. He weaves this all the way through. By chapter 3, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's a, that's a, oh, that's a beautiful text. When the word of Christ, when the word of God, the Bible, when his teaching, when his, you know, strength and faith as you were taught. How was I taught? Out of God's word. If God's word's not prominent in your life, neither will your faith be prominent. If God's word is not taking a hold on your, the way of thinking, then this world will dominate and distract you by the way you think. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another. Look at that community, right? right? So I try to weave it in, why? Because it's just there. It's there every time you turn around to scripture and truth. You bump into community. You bump into community. If you can't do community, you can't make forward progress. Teaching and admonishment of all wisdom and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with what? Gratitude in your hearts. It just drips off the page of the scriptures. God wants us to have this amazing faith perspective. And so that's why I say think about your faith as a, as a river because your faith is what empowers you to express gratitude. Did you know that? If you have no faith, then every circumstance can turn you away from gratitude. Every negative thing that comes down the road, and there's a lot of negative things that come down the road, can turn you from gratitude because you're complaining about this and you're, you know, um, bemoaning about that. But faith says, I serve a God that's greater than my circumstances. I serve a God that's inside me, wanting to rise up inside of me, wanting to fill my cup to overflowing. And Lord, I'm going to thank you because you're a God that has promised all the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. You're a God who's promised to take bad things and do good stuff, to take loss and create gain, to take things that are broken and to make them whole. You're a God that's promised to work in all circumstances for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. All the promises of God are yes and amen, and they should bring us to a place where we want to overflow. <laughs> How's your roots? How's your roots? How's your building? Are you expanding? How's your, what's the next one? How's your training? How's your gratitude? Are you choosing to be grateful? I've shared with you and I, uh, one of my favorite stories, Matthew Henry, a uh, uh, Bible commentator that lived in the 1800s uh, from England. <clears throat> After speaking at a, at, a, at a gathering of believers, he was on his way home, walking home uh, to his flat in London. He was mugged, robbed, um, tattered, beat up, made it back to his flat, sat down at his desk, lit, lit the wick of his candle, opened his journal, and pinned these words. Lord God, let me be thankful. First, because I've never been robbed before. Second, because although they took my wallet, they didn't take my life. Third, because although they took my all, it wasn't much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. Gratitude. Gratitude. It's a choice. Are you making the choice to drink up from your roots, to build up your relationship with Jesus, to strengthen your resolve to live for Him, and to choose to trust God by faith that He can take every trial and turn it into a triumph, every problem and turn it into something that's productive, every difficulty and turn it into something that's a development tool, because He will when you continue and you make progress. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we just want to uh, 
uh, pause in this moment and recognize, Lord, that we, we can so easily stall. I don't know where you're stalled or why you're stalled, but it probably has to do with some level of deception. Somewhere in the way you absorb and think and deliberate about truth, somewhere in your thought process, you've said, I don't need to train. I don't need to build anything. Somewhere you've been deceived to think that all you could do is stand still and the world's blessings will come to you. And they won't. Blessings come to those who are in forward progress, forward movement. And the Lord wants to call you into that place where you say, Lord, I want to live by the stream, but I want to bear fruit. And so, God, I want to continue to, to develop my faith and to build on what you've given me. Just tell him, if your building's not going so well, give me the courage to build. If you can recognize even this morning that part of your problem is that there's been no, collabora no collaboration. There's, there you're trying to build all alone. You, you're trying to figure it out all by yourself. And you need help. You need help. You're standing in, a, in an empty space, and you don't know how to do the first thing about construction with your spiritual life, then don't. Make, it, make a resolve. Make a commitment right now. Say, I'm not going to stay there. I'm going to ask. I'm going to speak up. God, I need help. I'm going to join a group or join a ministry team. I'm going to start trying to find mentors that can show me how to build people that can refine my way I deal with people and people help me refine the way I deal with money and people help me refine the way I deal with stress. And God, I need help. I just acknowledge that right here, right now. I need help to build, to train. There's, unless there's a plan you can show me how you move forward, you're probably not moving forward. What's your plan? How's your training? I want to invite you. You're the only one can decide the level of seriousness that you put into your faith. You're the only one. I can't do that for you. So why wouldn't you do it for yourself? What's your choice? Whisper to him, Jesus, help my resolve. I commit right now to build. Jesus, I commit right now to train. Jesus, I commit right now to find gratitude, to cultivate gratitude. Lord, I crave, I long for, I look forward to the day that I will overflow. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. God bless. Thanks for coming today. Have a great Sunday afternoon. Look forward to seeing you next week. God bless. Take care.